by Dominic McGough. Text copyright 2014 Dominic McGough. All rights reserved. Chapter 1 Appearances. A lovely couple, you might say, if you don't mind showy displays of affection. Granted, both of them are real lookers, especially her. Both are expensively dressed and very flashy, and they're just so into each other. Classic double act. Most people, most thinking people, would tend to dismiss them as a pair of desperate phonies or degenerate posers, especially considering how long they'd been together. It's their fourth anniversary as a couple next month, and well over three years married. It would be perfectly understandable to think that way, because there's just something so unnatural about it all. One would expect a married couple of three years standing would rather more likely be showing either the comfort or indeed discomfort that naturally comes from a union of such maturity. But instead they are like young lovers in those early, exciting and unfamiliar days of a budding romance, where they seem to be doing all that giddy, passionate bonding lark and getting to know one another. But after this long? Come on, get real. Sure, it's not quite as bad as... So, uh, what's your favourite colour? What? Really? Mine too. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up first, etc., etc., ad nauseum. But whatever, it's still pretty queer behaviour. Just look at that. What a total pantomime. Surely not every single thing, she says, can be that fascinating. And him, he must really like to laugh. He's doing such an awful lot of it. Eh. He'd think she was delivering the first-rate stand-up comedy routine but she certainly isn't. Actually, one would probably be more justified in thinking druggies, but they're definitely not. Richie and Janice's bright little three-year-old Duncan isn't nearly half as amused by his parents carrying on in this silly way as they seem to be. They're never like this at home. He stands beside them, yet he's very much all alone staring at nothing in particular with a vacant expression on his chubby little face. He absent-mindedly clutches his father's trouser leg while his parents giggle and kiss and fool around in a busy Glasgow supermarket cafeteria. Glances derived from all quarters of Janice's imaginary spectrum of popular opinion home in on the three of them from every direction. These looks range from jealous, cynical and disgusted all the way through nonplussed and curious, up to appreciative and occasionally even impressed, and she is aware of every single one of them. She likes the jealous ones best. It's better to have them all thinking mean-spirited thoughts about us than ignore us altogether, Richie, she'd laugh. He really couldn't care less about any of it, but tells her he agrees just to be on the safe side. Duncan's tiny index finger hooks over his lower front teeth, lost in a world of his own. Instinctively, his father reaches across and ruffles the boy's mop of ginger hair without once taking his eyes off his wife. He barely even notices this. His parents have been together a long time, forever, for all he knows. Outside in the vast car park, Wee Duncan watches the seagulls taking flight as his mother guns the huge Range Rover directly at the mall, scattering the congregation. The stupid laughter has finally stopped by now, which half pleases him, but as he is quite correctly guessed, it will soon be replaced by his mother's shouting. You just can't help it, can you? screeches the fiery red head as if to offer vocal accompaniment to the sound of the vehicle's wheels as she hauls them this way and that. She makes short work of the chicane and wide roundabout outside the store. Trash, that's what you are. You have to spoil everything, don't you? You're just such trash. Her husband sits there quietly, gripping his seat tightly as they speed home. He'd learned long before that the safest course of action, whenever something like this was going on with her during one of her episodes, was to remain completely silent. Previous efforts to defend himself in the past had invariably resulted in some sensitive part of his anatomy or other getting whacked or progged or bitten or squashed.
even now, as he sat quietly, those things weren't completely avoidable. He prayed she'd calm down before they got home. The week before, she got the skin on the back of his upper arm between the jaws of a set of rivet pliers. It took every ounce of his self-control not to punch her for it. She just wouldn't let go. But retaliation of any kind, physical or otherwise, was of course completely out of the question. She'd done that to him for some imagined transgression or other involving gambling. This time in the cafe he'd been caught, smiling at the girl on breakfasts. He hadn't even noticed the damned girl on breakfasts. He reckoned if it had not been for his strict Catholic background and beliefs he'd have ditched her long before Wee Duncan was even thought of. But the prospect of possibly spending eternity in the fiery pits of hell and damnation or some such just for his pathetic intolerance of a few daft wee bruises here and there, every now and again, seemed to Richie to be perfectly unthinkable. And let's not forget, she was very pretty. And when she was good, she was very, very good. There are many people who will tell you that there's no such thing as a funny woman. Those people are perfect fools. A mere five minutes in Janice's company would cure even the staunchest sceptic of his ignorance. The truth is that Janice had always been exceptionally funny and observant and witty and interesting, porky as you like. And once over, she was actually quite charming. That particular aspect of her personality, however, was sadly very much on the wane these days. But she'd always come across as quite complimentary to Richie's shy and pliable, though rather drab, personality. In fact, that's why she liked him at first and he her. She was certainly entertaining, for a while at least. One could only ever grow bored of Janice when one's brain can no longer keep up. Then you'd have to switch off and have a break. That was something Janice never did. Anyone who spent any amount of time in her company could see that. Spend a full day or so at the circus, you're sharp sicken of it. The thing is, she would have been just so unbelievably popular if she could only have managed to shut a trap once in a while. She was always showing off, continually flaunting her intellect. Those are the times when she'd cease to be interested in company and be seen as more of a complete pain in the arse. She must have known that too. Even so, woe betide anyone who would even so much as dream of yawning or glazing over whenever the pretty red-haired locksmith's daughter was talking. She liked to have her own way, but okay, who doesn't? It's just that she was always so obnoxious the way she'd go about getting it. Take common or garden household tasks, for instance. There was this squeaky stair in their house, third one down. She'd regularly spend anything up to a minute standing on it, going up and down on tiptoe to make it groan and creak and squeak like, like a barrel of seasick guinea pigs or something. She started doing that a year before basically to irritate him into fixing it, rather than simply mention it and persistently nag about it until it was seen to like any other ordinary wife would have done. He wanted to shout and tell her, D-I-Y, Y-L-F-B. But rather than show any sign of infuriation, he would usually just say that he'd see to it when he'd got a spare minute, just to keep her off his case for a little longer. Risky business. Richie didn't especially like being at work. The place was full of idiots and he missed his son terribly. Even so, he chose to spend as much time there as was humanly possible. Who, other than your average security guard or someone like that, actually considers being at work a time to relax? And yet there he was all the time, often having told her that it was much busier this month than it really was and that they depended on him to be there constantly. That which at least appeared to be a phenomenal can-do mentality and work ethic to his bosses ensured he got to the very top very quickly, which consequently brought with it all the rewards that come with the territory, or else, funnily enough, Janice would have ditched him herself by now. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. As a matter of fact, Richie did actually begin there as the warehouse security guard, not long after graduating from business school. It didn't take long for his supervisors to notice the ridiculous number of hours he put in at work, 
which, when viewed in conjunction with its general amiability, common sense, and a certain natural congeniality towards everyone, incidentally gave him an edge over his genuinely ambitious counterparts. Within 18 months, he was made a partner of the firm and then was duly running the show. He was single-handedly responsible for the entire warehouse floor, no doubt much to the chagrin of his employees, many of whom had openly looked down upon him from their then marginally loftier milling or forklift jobs less than two years prior. He had to admit he owed a good deal of his fancy patter to Janice, and albeit indirectly it was because of her that he'd grown to be so diligent and keen to be at work. So for that much, he felt a sort of perverse gratitude towards her. It often struck him that a gradual kind of transfer of virtue was taking place. It seemed to him almost like, as he grew more charming and interesting and impressive in life, she would become less so. It was entirely one-sided. Janice was evidently not especially fussed about adopting any of Richie's particular qualities. In a way, she was losing herself, and they both knew it. Janice's outstanding wit and skills of observation came at no little cost to her mind. Or, as is more likely the case, those things were the product of a pre-existing imbalance of it. She noticed everything. Unfortunately, to notice everything is often to notice more than is actually there. That was Janice's great fault and the most apparent symptom of her illness, for such indeed it was. And that in turn led to some very bad times for all three of them, especially Richie. He went upstairs and hid his little son in the nursery when they got back in from shopping, shuddering involuntarily when he heard the predictable jangling of the contents of their trophy cabinet as she slammed closed the lid of the wine chest. Janice did not drink often, but certainly made up for any abstinence on those occasions when she would. He felt sure that in the cold light of morning she'd be telling him something like, Oh, Richie, Richie, woo. You know Janny's got to cut loose a little bit now and then. You understand. You make her so cross sometimes that she thinks she might explode if she doesn't have a little drinky booze. It always makes her feel a little bit better about everything bad that you do, doesn't it, you naughty boy? This would be the closest thing that he could hope for by way of an apology for her having maybe punched him in the balls or clawed him the night before. Seriously. Richie knew he could expect something like a fork in the thigh, or a thick ear, or a shiner from a flying toaster to the head well before midnight. He did not, however, expect that he would in fact be regaining consciousness wearing only his underpants while sitting chained to an industrial waste bin behind the block of flats roughly 500 yards from his house. Were it not for those who were responsible for the voices and the torchlight in his face that eventually brought him round, he'd certainly have died that night from exposure to the elements. Scotland in early January is surely no place for one to be found chained to a backyard dumpster, unconscious and in nothing but one's underwear. But having said that, if you ever end up in a similar situation yourself, it is actually for the best if you are found. The first powdery flakes of the coming snowstorm danced around the bins like tiny sparks of magic, or maybe more like a tribe of gleeful tramps. No, this is near Jakey Mary. Eh, hey boy, you're not a stupid, are you? Ah, can he's no. Poor bugger. What are you doing here, son? Chained up to your dustbin, nothing but your fancy drawers. Mary, get the tools from the boot, will you? By the time the young WPC Mary Spraff had returned to her partner, Richie was on his feet and already free of his clumsily secured chains. His feet were injured, though not seriously. He presumed from Janice having dragged him there from the garage. He remembered he was definitely in the garage, fixing the vacuum cleaner motor, then nothing more. Now he stood shivering and prodding tentatively at the back of his head before proceeding to pull crusty bits of blood from his matted hair with his fingernails. She handed him some coffee from a flask she'd taken from the glove box, which he accepted with astonishing eagerness. Then she wrapped him in her overcoat. That was when she happened to notice that he had the word trash, carefully scratched, rune-like, across his bare stomach in blue ink, and more dry blood where the ballpoint pen nib had broken the skin there also. Some once popular observed the attractive young policewoman when her colleague had left them to get the police car and bring it nearer. 
Enough's enough, said Richie to himself, still shaking with cold, and holding his cup in both hands close to him like it might have been a baby bird, he turned to her and announced, I'd like to make a formal complaint. My wife, Janice McGonagall, has done this to me. She's as mad as a box of lorries. She's nuttier than squirrel shite, and I think she will kill me soon if I allow this to continue. I would like to put a stop to all of her outrageous loony behaviour right now. I think I've been nothing but a coward since I met her, and I've gone along and put up with so much, just for the sake of an easy life. It never worked, and now I've had enough of it. Enough's enough. And with that, he threw the rest of the warm coffee down his gullet and dropped the empty styrofoam cup into the big bin. He noticed her watching him with her eyebrows raised and the half-light from what little managed to filter across from the sodium lamps over the yard wall. It was really starting to snow quite heavily now.